Father, in the name of Yeshua, we thank you. We give you glory uh, for this day, this day that you've called and set us apart. This day that you have ordained before the foundation of the world that to be set apart in ministry today. So we thank you for them. We thank you for your choice. We thank you for the anointing that you've already placed upon their life. And we thank you for the word on today that it will give us a deeper understanding and bring clarity to us as to our purpose and our calling, the seriousness of it, and the effect that our words have on those that will listen to us. Father, be glorified today in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. Today, um, we are going to be set on apart, consecrating two, two people that are of God's choice, not my choice, not my words, not my doings, but this is a work of the Lord, and I am excited and glad about it in Yeshua's name. So, God has chosen a couple, a married couple today to be placed into the body of Yeshua, into this local assembly as ministers. And it blesses me when the father calls the husband and the wife together. Because the word of God tells us that how can two walk together except they be agreed, that they walk in agreement. And the best place that a couple can be in agreement on and about is the things of God, the calling of God, the purpose, the plan of God for their life. For them both to say yes to the Father, for them both to say I submit to the will, I submit to the call, I submit to the responsibility, and I thank you, Father, for honoring me and choosing me. So today's title of the message is going to be don't even try it. Don't even try it. That's a peculiar message, you might say, for those that are going to be consecrated. But it's a serious, serious, serious statement. If you have not been called, predestined, chosen by God to be in ministry, don't even try it. Don't take it upon yourself to say, this is what I choose to do. Don't simply go to school and say, I have an education or I have a diploma. Educations and diplomas are good. But that is not what qualifies you in the kingdom of God. What qualifies you in the kingdom of God is knowing that your names are written in heaven, in the Lamb's Book of Life. And even in the tablets of heaven, before the earths were formed, you were always in the mind of God. And this day was ordained for you, that you began to walk in your heavenly and holy calling as ministers in the body. So we're going to begin today, and we're going to be reading from the Amplified. I, I, I like the Amplified because it's a very simple language, and it gives us a better understanding as to what the scriptures are saying. So as we look at Matthew, the 22nd chapter, and I'm just going to read the first verse, then I'm going to skip down, and then we're going to begin to just expound on some things that the Father wants us to hear today. And the very first verse says this, Jesus spoke to them again in parables. 
Jesus spoke to the people in parables. He spoke to the people in very simple ways, in very simple language, so that they could understand what he was saying. He would take natural things and then apply it and give the spiritual meaning of it. The Apostle Paul did the same thing. He says, first natural, then spiritual. If we can understand some natural principles, then it will better help us to understand and apply it to the spiritual principles. And hopefully we can gain a deeper and a greater understanding of that. God's word is simple. God's word is not complicated. We are sheep. We're the sheep of God and sheep have their own qualities and sheep uh, are not that smart and sheep are not that intelligent. So God calls us his sheep. So he feeds us in a very simple form, in a very simple manner so that we can walk away with a clear understanding as to what he was saying so that we can apply it appropriately to our lives. Until we understand the word of God and until we actually receive the word of God into our spirit in a very simple manner, that is the only time that you're going to be able to apply it. The word of God says, in all of that getting, get an understanding. We must understand the word of God. So Jesus is speaking to this gathering that was around him and he wasn't preaching. He wasn't using a very loud voice, but oftentimes he would bring the people, he would gather the people around him and he would sit them down so that they would be quiet and he would begin to feed them spiritual manner spiritual bread from heaven he will begin to give them the word of god and he would break it in such small small pieces so that they would be able to chew it and digest it and the word would begin to swell in their innermost being and that word would take hold of them on the inside and the word that they heard that they were that was able to be digested into their natural bodies it began to change them they took on a greater and a better understanding that all of the scribes and all of the Pharisees was teaching because they were only teaching the law. But Jesus Christ came and he taught in such a manner that it was spirit on that word. That word became alive and that word began to nurture them. That word began to transform them into the very image of the Father. So he's teaching them, and he said this to them in a very simple manner, because he knew that the people were sheep, and he knew that they had no spiritual understanding. And he says, I want them to understand. So he says, I am teaching to himself spiritual things, but I'm giving it to you in a natural, broken down manner so that you can hear it so that it will not overwhelm you, so that it will not frighten you. Sheep are skittish and they're, they're very easy to, to, to become afraid. So he, he spoke to them in such a mild, sweet manner. And they were able to sit still and absorb that pure word that was coming forth from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And he said, it's the kingdom of heaven. And I'm reading from the Amplified. And the parable was this to you. He says, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king. Glory. Who gave a wedding feast for his son. And he sent his servants to call those who had previously been invited to the wedding feast. But they refused to come. They refused to come. 
And verse 4 says, then he sent out some other servants saying, tell those who have been invited or called. The word here in the Amplified says invited. The word in the King James says call. So we're using these words interchangeably. You've been invited, you've been in call. An invitation has been sent to you to come to this great feast that the king has prepared for you. But there were those that refused. And verse 4 says, Then he sent out some other servants, saying, Tell those who have been invited or called, Look, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fattened calves are butchered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. Hallelujah. Glory, God has set before us a table, a prepared table. And he says, come in yes. and sit down and sup with me. Yes. Glory to God. This is the king, hallelujah, that Jesus was referring to. The king that sent out the invitation was God. He said, you come to my son. And I prepared a table before you. And you're going to feast forevermore. Now listen to this. He says, everything is ready for the wedding feast. Now, we're going to go down. Now, verse 11. Let's go down to verse 11. I want you to read this entire chapter because I have a lot that I want to share with you today. So we're not going to do all of the reading in this chapter. But I want you to read it in your own time because there were those that were invited. There were those that were called. But they made excuses as to why they could not come. Just an invitation to call has been sent out to those today. I mean, I make, well, I go to my mother's church. My family goes to this church. I like this past over here. I don't have time to come. I have to work. Making excuses not to come to this great wedding feast. Now, verse 11, but listen to this. But when the king came in to see the dinner guests, he saw a man there who was not dressed. Now the king is coming in and he's examining his guests. He's examining those that have been called. Now this has been a process of time. Now the king is coming in to examine to see if you're ready to sit down and feast with him. We're being examined. And you're going to continue to be examined. And then this is what the king said. He saw a man there who was not dressed, was not in the proper attire. I'm going to break some things in a moment. He was not dressed appropriately in wedding clothes. And the king said, friend, 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 you were called. You were invited. I sent you a special invitation, and I call you friend to come and dine and to sup with me. But you came inappropriately dressed. You cannot present yourself to the king unless you're on the proper clothing. Now, this is Eastern culture that Jesus Christ is really talking about here because there were some specific things that the, that, that the Eastern culture did. And this is what Jesus was alluding to because they understood the culture of the time. And let's go back and finish reading. And he said, Fred, how did you come? in here without wearing the wedding clothes that were provided for you. And the man was speechless and without excuse. Then the king said to the attendants, tie him hand and foot and throw him into the darkness outside. In that place there will be weeping over sorrow and pain and grinding of teeth, over distress and anger. 
For many are called, many are invited, many have been summoned, but few are chosen. Now let's look just for a second at this Eastern culture, why the king was so upset with the one that received the invitation and that came to stand before the king to be judged, to be assessed as to whether or not he was ready to sit down at the table and sup with him. The invited guest was invited and he came to the wedding. He was invited, he accepted the invitation, and he came. But had not on the proper attire. It was customary during the Eastern culture for the king, when he invited you to a feast, that he would provide the clothing for this feast. And the clothing that he would provide, listen to this, for the feast was long white robes. It was provided for him. He didn't have to go out and try to purchase his own, but the king himself provided it for him. The guest refused to change his garment. Are you listening? Yes. The guest refused to change his filthy, unprepared, highway, carnal clothing for the robe of righteousness that Jesus Christ already provided for him. Refuse the redemptive work of Jesus Christ. I'm going somewhere. Hold on. Remember, I'm teaching. He kept on his old highway clothing, dirty, tattered, filthy, unpresentable, attempting to be accepted by God in his own righteousness. Refusing to allow God to turn his heart. Refusing to allow the word to renew his mind. Refusing to deny the works of his carnal mind producing carnal acts. He refused the finished work, all he had to do was accept it. Listen, we're going somewhere. That robe of righteousness that the king was representing to the guests was the robe of Jesus Christ. We're going to show you. It was drenched in the blood of Yeshua himself. But he refused. Simply because you're called. Simply because you're predestined does not mean you're presentable. Hallelujah. We're going to show you something. God don't care nothing about you just being called. Many are called. Many refused. Many had excuses. Many were called. Many were predestined. But they were cast into outer darkness because they refused to change their garments and put on the robe of righteousness, which is putting on Christ Jesus himself. I want this to soak in because there's too much foolishness. It's too many that have been called. 
It's too many that have been predestined, but have not changed their clothing, attempting to present themselves in their old self, that old man, refusing to put on the new man. Refusing for their character to be shaped and molded. Refusing to be humbled. Refusing to obey. Refusing to embrace truth. Still having our own mindset, our own way of doing things. The word of God tells us in Romans 3, 19 to 23, you don't have to turn there. All of our righteousness is as a filthy rag. There's no righteousness in us. Our righteousness is not accepted to God. Our good deeds apart from Jesus Christ are not acceptable to him. High standards and morals are not acceptable to God except you have changed your clothing and put on Jesus Christ. He is the way, he's the truth, he is the light. He gives us access to the Father. All of the good things we do. It's not good enough. It does not give us a seat at the banquet table to sup with Jesus Christ. It's an outward work. No flesh will glory in the presence of God. It is only spirit to spirit. True righteousness can only be obtained and had through Jesus Christ, through repentance, through acknowledging that we are unworthy in ourselves, but when we were sinners, dead in sins and trespasses, Jesus Christ came and took our sins, took our transgressions, took our iniquities upon himself so that we could be clean, so that we could be called the righteousness of God. Not simply in word, but in action, in deed, our character. Yes. People of God, God wants us to know today that it is not what you do because you say you're a good person. It is not what you say. It is not what you preach. It is your character that defeats you. God is after your character. It's your changed way of thinking, your changed way of living, your mind being renewed to think like Jesus Christ, putting off that old man that was born after sin and death. No, there was none righteous. No, not one was righteous. All of the great patriarchs that went on before us, including Moses, including Abraham, they too had to believe Jesus Christ. They too had to go into paradise and could not enter to the very presence of God until Jesus Christ came himself and presented himself before them. They were not able to. All of the good things that they did Moses was suffering with the people, the Hebrews wandering in the promise in the wilderness for 40 years. It did not earn him the right alone to enter to the presence of a holy God. He had to acknowledge Christ. He had to see the Christ. And he had to say, you are the Christ. 
We must be changed people. This message is not for everyone. But we can see the evil times all around the world. And God is sending forth a pure message to those that he said, come, come. There's a feast being prepared for you. I'm preparing a table for you. But you cannot only accept the invitation. You must change. You must be dressed appropriately. You must put on Christ. Revelation 7 and 14 through 17. Just write this down. Those are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Came out of the great tribulation. Seven years of torment on earth. Seven years of being tortured. Seven years for those that would not receive or acknowledge Jesus Christ. Receive the mark of the beast, which means their mind. The enemy changed their mind. The mind, that is the mark of the beast. It's not going to be just a visible uh, three, six. It's your mind. The word of God says that there are 144,000 that did not stop following the lamb. They did not receive the lies of Satan. That's what the enemy is coming after, people of God. It's your mind. It's your character. It's not a physical 666. It's your mind. The enemy wants you to refuse Jesus. This is why the word is so powerful. Renew your mind. Be transformed. Do not be conformed to the world. We're in the world, but we don't think like the world. We don't act like the world. That's what the enemy is coming after. But I, I, I'm coming to buy groceries. He's still going to look at your hand and say, Six, no, do you deny Christ? Yes, they'll come in and purchase. I need clothing. Do you believe in Jesus? Yes. I'm going to behead you. That's what he's coming after. That's why the enemy in this society has like a, 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 a metal iron cap on your head. The enemy has, has, has mimicked everything that God has done. Jesus said, put on the helmet of salvation. The enemy says, put on the helmet of doubt, fear, and unbelief. God wants to protect our mind, renew our mind by his word. The enemy wants to steal your mind by filling it with lies. It's your mind. It's your thought life that God wants to change. And this is why the enemy, all the social media, feeding with all of the garbage and all of the junk in the world. And you're taking it into your mind and you're feeding your spirit and you're polluted on the inside. So when the truth of God's word comes, your mind is so filled with garbage and filth and, 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 and polluted garbage, you cannot hear the word. Your, your ears are blocked. Your ears are plugged up. Your eyes, hallelujah, you can't see the God of this world. Have darkened your eyes. Plugged up your ears so that you won't even hear the truth. He's after your man. He want to keep your man in darkness. 
He wants to keep your mind polluted with filth. He's after your mind. Hallelujah. That's why all of the stress, the temptations. He wants you to be concerned about your problem instead of casting your cares upon him. Trust in the Lord with all that heart. Lean not to thine understanding. Acknowledge him in all thy ways. And he shall direct your path. He don't want your mind filled with that. He wants you to see the problem and never the solution. That's his strategy. The tricks, the wiles of the enemy that's been shot at us each and every day. Snared by your own thoughts. Glory to God. These people went through, but they did not deny. And their robes were washed in the pure blood of the Lamb. And they were invited in to set and to feast with Jesus. These are some scriptures about being clothed in righteousness. We're not going to read all of them and give them to you. You write them down. Job 29 and 44, Revelations 19 and 8, Isaiah 61 and 10, Psalms 132 and 9, Zechariah 3 and 4, Revelations 3 and 4, 2 Corinthians 5 and 21, Ephesians 4 and 24, Ephesians 6 and 14. There was a priest, Joshua, you will find that in Zechariah, was ministering to the people. A priest of God were the Ephrod. Were the chiefly garments on the outside was dressed like a priest. But purer are the eyes of God. He looks beyond the outward appearance. He looks beyond our outward attire. And God said, tell Joshua. Yes, he's a priest. Yes, he's been called. Yes, he's been predestined. <laughs> yes, he's been ministering to the people. But his garments are filthy, which means his heart was filthy. His heart was not right. His heart was not pure. His character was not changed. Yet he was a priest. You may be called, you may be pre predestined. God don't remove the calling. He don't change the fact that you're chosen. He just said, but you got to change your garments. The calling is there. But you're not going to sit down and feast with me. You can walk in the office. You can walk in the calling. You can call yourself apostle and bishop and pastor and teacher and evangelist. But your garments are filthy. Your heart is filthy. Your character is not acceptable. I see you. I see who you really are. I see through what you are pretending to be. I'm all wise God, he says. You cannot deceive me. Amen. You've been called. Beautiful couple. Predestined. Hands are going to be laid on you today. Declaring by the auction and calling of the Most High that you've been called to be ministers. The calling has already taken place. 
The laying on of hands today by me, your apostle, is simply an outward expression of what God has already done. I can't change your calling. You can't change your calling. The giftings and callings of God are without repentance. Whether you walk in it or not, you've still been called. Man can't take that away from you. You disqualify yourself. God has not changed his mind. He will not change his mind. But you got to go on. We're going to get ready to go into some things. Are we going a little deeper? Can we go a little deeper this morning? Yes. Yes. Some things you got to do. Some things you got to understand. All right. Okay. Let's move on. The word of God says that many are called, but few are chosen. This was a very honorable place to be called and chosen. Oh my God, hallelujah, I'm so sorry. <laughs> All right, don't y'all try that on me. So, I thought I had it off, but amen. But, but if it ring again, that's my accountant. I'll meet with my tax accountant immediately after service. See, I pay my taxes. I obey the laws of the land. Uh, but God's going to change his mind about you. Now, after I lay hands on you, we're going to depart. But it's left up to you as to whether or not you walk in it. It's going to be your decision. It's going to be some difficult times. It's going to be some hard times. It's supposed to be. Challenging times. Times of temptation. Times where you might feel like I want to walk away. But the calling is there. It's your decision. Amen? Amen. All right. So people... Talk about the seriousness of the calling. People listen to you. You will have influence. People will make decisions depending upon the word that you teach, that you speak into their hearing. People's lives will be changed because of the word and the anointing on the words that you speak. People will be deceived by words that you speak, if they are not words of truth. You will speak words and very wonderful words. You may sound like an orator, but there has to be an anointing on your word. It is the, it's not just your words. And it's not even just the word of God alone. <laughs> you can teach and preach the word, but it will not affect the people unless there's an anointing on it. It is the anointing that destroys the yoke. That's the qualifying. We're going to get to it. Isaiah 50 and 4, talking about how the people will make decisions in their life depending upon how and what you teach them. Isaiah 50 and 4 says, The Lord God hath given me ministers, pastors, teachers, apostles, bishops. The Lord hath given me. What has the Lord given me? The tongue of the learned. The words that we speak must be words that we've learned, that we have been taught. You can't teach until you have been taught. Jesus could not teach and did not teach until the Father had taught him. He says, I speak what the Father speaks. I do what the Father do. My words are not my words. These words are the words of the Father. So if we are going to stand in the place of ministry, we must be learned. We must be taught first. The husbandman is the 
first partaker of the word. Don't attempt to try to teach something with power, authority, and the anointing when you have not applied it to your own life. It's the word. But there's no anointing on it. It's falling flat. It's not piercing hearts. It's not broken, breaking through uncircumcised hearts. It's the word that circumcised. It's the word that cuts away the full skin of the heart so that the word can enter into it. But if there's no anointing on what you say, people holler, scrap, shout, scream. That's why so much shouting in the church. It's carnality. It's flesh. It's superficial. It's emotional. It ministers to the flesh, but it never touches the heart. It never touches people's heart. And all you will ever have is a form of godliness. People sitting in the pew that's full of religion, that's only a form of godliness, but no power. No power. And in churches today, churches are powerless. They are powerless. They are powerless. No healings, no deliverances, no demons being cast out. No prophecy. No manifestations of the gift. No anointing. People come. Oh, that was a good word. And you ask them two minutes later, give me a scripture. They can't do it. Because it's simply laid on the top of their head. It never entered in. The word of God talks about the conditions of the heart. How that when you hear the word, you hear it with joy, full of exuberance. <laughs> but anon, the word of God says, anon, as soon as, quickly as, trouble come, temptations come, trials, tests come, you fall by the wayside. Because the word never entered into your heart. The word of God is our stabilizer. The word of God with the anointing upon it is our ability to stand in a storm. It gives us that sure foundation that we can build upon so that when the storms of life come, the rains of life come, hallelujah, we still stand. As Maya Angelou said, I, I rise. We rise, still I rise. All the hell I've been through, still I rise. Because of foundation, because of truth, because of the decision to stay the course, to do it God's way and not my way. Allowing the word of God to shape and Change my character, integrity, honor, dignity, class, saying no. That's what the word of God will do to you. He, it fortifies us. And the Father sent the paracletes along beside us to help us. He gave us the Holy Ghost on the inside that makes intercession for us when we pray, when we don't know how to pray. The Spirit of God prays the prayer of the Father for us, and we're strengthened by that. God gives us a tongue of the learn. When you teach, something should be happening to people. That, that should be an interaction of the word on the inside of them. 
We are not performers. We are not up here to perform. We are not up here to entertain. We are not up here to be seen. We are up here to change your lives. And to prepare you for the great feast. Hallelujah. This is serious. People don't take it serious. Learn. What that means is that God has given me the tongue of the learn. You will find that in Hebrew um, language 39, 25. It means that you have been instructed. When you are learned, when you have learned something, you've been instructed by someone. You have instructions. They told you how to do it, when to do it, how to do it, when to say it, what to say, who to say it to, whom, who not to say it to. You are being instructed. You're not only being instructed in and by and through the word, you're being instructed by the Holy Ghost. He writes to your sermon, not you. I just write down what I hear. I'm not that smart. I, I'm not that smart that, that I can just sit down you know, I can't in my foot, but I don't have time for that. So because I know I'm a student in the school of the Holy Spirit, I allow him to teach me. I allow him to instruct me. Then I can teach and instruct you. Then there's an anointing on what I say. We must be instructed. By the word and by the Holy Ghost. Glory. Study to so thy self approve. Unto God a workman that needeth not rightly divide, uh, 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 dividing the word of truth. Yes, we are, are study. But I put the word in my heart and then I allow the Holy Spirit to bring it together Amen. as he wants you to hear it. You can't get this just in the book. That's what theologians do. The, the, theology is a study of God without a relationship with God. Yeah. Not, not. Yeah, I have two degrees in theology. A degree in biblical studies a doctorate in divinity. Am I impressed by that? No. You listen to me talk, you would never know it. But I can talk to talk. But it's not important. Because there is no anointing on knowledge alone. <laughs> Hallelujah. All knowledge does puff you up and make you think you know something and make you think that you're anointed, but yet lives are not being changed, including your own. The teacher must first be affected by the word. <laughs> Jesus was the word made flesh. He became the living word. And he manifested the word in everything that he did and everything that he said. And he gave the glory to the Father. Amen. So when we learn, when we are learned the tongue of the learned, we are instructed. We have been taught. We are a disciple means that we are followers of Jesus Christ. That's why I tell you all the time, I mimic no one. And that's not a person on the face of this earth that I want to be like. You said that's arrogant. No, it's not. No, it is not. I respect people and I honor people. I want to be like Jesus. Hallelujah. That's why I tell you all the time, 
I said, I, I watched Jesus. I, I studied Jesus. I studied. He's a perfect example. I studied Jesus. I don't follow people. I don't watch people. I, I, whatever you do is your decision. I don't care what you wear. I don't care. I don't care what you don't wear. That's your decision. Hallelujah. I don't try to talk like you. Don't walk like you. Now, now I was under a bishop, and people tell me I have a lot of his mannerisms. That was because I was connected to his anointing. But I didn't want to be like him. But there are certain things that, that he did, <laughs> I did, and still do. Because there was an anointing on him. And if you hang out with the anointing, and you, your heart is right, it's going to rub off on you. Hallelujah. It's going to rub off on you. Hallelujah. Not like you, not trying to be like them. It's that anointing. That's what the anointing is supposed to be. The anointing is supposed to be upon us so that we can smear it on you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And not just an outward show, but a heart from the heart. So it means that we have used the word. How are you able to discern and eat strong meat? How are you able to receive strong word, pure word? Now, a baby can't. You still getting upset when the truth comes? You're a babe. Yeah. You had enough sleep last night yet? When the pure word starts coming, you sleepy. You still a baby. A baby just not off any time. A baby don't have no control. <laughs> but the word of God says that when we are learned, we have used the word by process of use. That's how you become strong. That's how you can discern truth. That's when the auction is alive in you. When you know error and when you know truth. When you know it's truth and when it's flesh. By process of use. That's how you become discerning. And you go from faith to faith and strength to strength. Hallelujah. 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 The word of God tells us that I, the Lord has given me the tongue to learn that I should know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. He waketh mine ear to hear as to learn. Your ears need to be unplugged. Your ears are plugged up. You need to get, let the word be a spiritual Q-tip and, and clean out your ears. The word of God says, he wakeneth my ear to hear. <laughs> Your spiritual ear. You know the voice of the Holy Spirit. You know when he's speaking. Because your spiritual ear has been awakened, has become acquainted with. You've had fellowship and you have fellowship with him. And you know his voice. My sheep know my voice and no other will they hear. They won't even hear, let alone follow. They're not going to listen because it's not the voice of my shepherd. <laughs> my God. That's why you need a shepherd that has his hands on your under shepherd. So your under shepherd can hear what the shepherd is saying. Hallelujah. So the under shepherd can speak to you what thus saith God. And not give you fairy tales and something sweet and tickling to your ear that's going to make you feel good, that's going to make you jump and shout. Jesus told them, sit them down so they can hear. I'm going to feed them naturally and spiritually. But sit them down and tell them to be quiet because I'm going to speak. 
Glory to God. Glory. The word of God says in Proverbs 6 and 2 that people are snared by the words that you speak. You can snare people, pulpit, teachers, preachers, apostles, bishops. You can snare them. You can tear them. You can destroy them. You can hurt them. You can damage them. You can kill them by the words that you speak. Amen. Now, I'm not talking about when, you, when you're telling them the truth. Because <laughs> if that's the truth, okay, uh, that bishop I was on, I would have died. <laughs> Because he cut, and he cut deep. When you don't tell people the truth, you're snaring them. When you pamper people and keep them in the position of their own mindset, and you don't come after that demon spirit, you are snaring them, and they will not grow. They will remain stagnant. They will not re fulfill their purpose and their calling. Oh, I was hurt sitting up in that church. I was hurt a lot, many a time. Many a time. That man of God was standing up there with his little skinny self, and he wasn't trying to hurt me. It was that word that was cutting me up. It was that word that was identifying me. And I sat right there. And I listened. And boy, I would get in my car and cry all the way home. I would cry. I would weep. Boo-hoo. Not because I was angry, but because I was felt so bad and so hurt that I was so far from God. Yeah. So those tears were not tears of anger, as some of you do. <laughs> but they were tears of brokenness, of sorrow, crying out like David, Oh, God, don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Renew in me the right spirit. God, give me a broken heart and a contrite spirit. I'd cry all the way home, run home, feed my kids. And before the doors of the churches, I was right back there at the park, and I waited to get beat up some more, on, waiting for it. The word was fiery hot all the time. They kept pastors meeting, ministers meeting, board meeting, Sunday school meeting. It was hot. But the word of God is supposed to come to us as fire. That man that God had been beaten on, he had been hammered, he had been shapen, he had placed himself in the hands of God. He knew that he was clay when he was under his apostle, and he allowed the word of God through that man of God to shape him. He allowed it. So he was strong and he was firm. And he says, I'm a hammer. And I'm a hammer with this word. Anybody that will allow me to hammer them. But I'm in the hands of God. I've been called. And, and he gave <laughs> gifts to men. And that word men is mankind. It don't mean just the gender, men. It means God knew that I was a woman, and God knows I'm a woman. He knew that before the foundation of the world. And he says, I've called Frankie, and I'm placing her in the gospel. And I'm going to put her in a female body. God knew that. So don't, don't tell me nothing about God didn't call women. All right, all right. The most anointed person on this earth is a woman. She gave birth to God. Hallelujah. 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 
Man didn't have nothing to do with it. <laughs> it was a woman. God chose a woman to give birth to God through Jesus manifested in the flesh. Man didn't have nothing to do with it. That woman stayed a virgin until after Jesus was born. It's a lot of chauvinism out there. And they'll tell you they were down, they were trying to talk. But they never come to me one-on-one. -on -one. I've never been challenged. Not one time. I know I'm talked about, but I've never been challenged because they know better. People know the true anointed when they come in contact with it, whether they want to acknowledge it or not. People know. That's why they hated Jesus so. Because he had the true anointing. That's why they crucified him. Because of envy. They didn't even know they were doing the will of the Father. Hallelujah. I'm taking my time. I'm not finished. I've already been up here an hour. Because you need to hear that. It's too much mess out here, and I'm tired of it. I'm tired of people putting titles on themselves and saying, I'm a this and I'm a that. I'm tired of it. God is tired of it. And somebody has got to be bold enough to stand up and just tell the truth. Do you qualify? You're going somewhere. Glory. For many are invited, many are summoned. That's what that word called, are invited. Summoned, but few are chosen. Now let's look at um, Romans. Glory to God. So I, I'm using um, this glory. Uh, we're going to go to Romans, and we're going to go to um, chapter 8. And we're going to start with verse, I think we'll start with verse, um, this is, now this is acting up, I'm telling you. <laughs> Even my, Lord, I, I don't know. I'm going to try it one more time, then I just go. I don't know. All right, somebody give me a Bible. I'm going to leave. Oh, that's too fine, even with my glasses. All right, that's good. I'll use this one. Thank you. Romans 8. And we'll start with verse 28. And I want you to sit right there so that I can hand you your phone so you can operate it for me. Yes, Amen. Amen. Okay. Here you go. Okay. Romans 8 and 28. Well, you know what? Uh, I, my, 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 my pastor would say, you know when you in it, because the devil do everything he can to stop you. Yeah. Now I have two electronic things, brand new, top of the line, and all of them stuck. But I'm fully persuaded that nothing shall separate me. All right, Romans 8 and 28, listen. And we're reading from the Amplified Transliteration again. And we know with great confidence, you got to know, because you're going to be challenged. You're going to be talked about, especially if you're going to preach the truth and teach the truth, especially if you're going to leave all that traditional teaching behind. You got to separate yourself from some people. You see what I'm saying? Yes. Tell me. You, you, you have to do that. 
The people of God have to separate themselves. You can't associate with everybody. You can't talk to everybody. You, you just cannot. Okay? And we know with great confidence that God, who is deeply concerned about us, causes all things to work together as a plan. You may be going through some things right now. You may be experiencing some things right now. But God has a plan for what you're going through. Yes. You might not know it, but you're gaining an experience that you would not have had if you're not going through something. Yeah. That's when your faith is tested. All things work together as a plan. For the good, for those who love God, to those who are called. When God called you, when he predestined you, he placed some opposition in your path. Did you know he did that? He did it to the Hebrew. He took them a long way around to place opposition in their path, to test them, to see if they would believe him, to see if they would trust him, to see if they would have confidence of what he said. I'm bringing you out to take you in. God brought you out to take you in. So you're going to have some obstacles. You're going to have some difficulties. You're supposed, if you don't have any obstacles or difficulties, I always did this. When I first got saved, the Father gave me wisdom. I was going through so much. My life was like a, a golf course. I, mean, I was out of one hole into it. I mean, just bam, bam. The devil was trying to wear me out. And I said, Father, why is this happening to me? I said, you're going to have to show me. Am I going through all of this because I'm in sin? Or am I going through all of this because you're testing me? Show me what's happening. Now, if I'm going through this because I'm in sin, show me so that I can repent and get it right. And if I'm going through all of this because I'm walking in the, your plan, then I know you've already strengthened me to walk through it. You better know that. You got to know. You got to know that. And you got to judge it. Judge your test. Judge your tribulation. You got to judge it. Why? What am I doing wrong? What have I done wrong? I repent it, gave my life to you. I'm living all I know how to live. Yet, I'm going through these things. Continue, daughter. Tribulation worketh patience. Patience, hope. And your hope maketh you not ashamed. You're learning something. You're learning. It's a learning process. We're in school. Remember, we're being taught. Yes. We're disciples. Jesus learned obedience through the things that he suffered. He didn't know if he was going to be obedient to the Father, fulfilling the cross, if he hadn't gone through some horrible experiences. But he was able to endure because he knew that it was in the plan of God. He told his disciples, he says, I, I, I'm on my way to Jerusalem. And he said, there's a baptism. <laughs> I'm going to go through something in Jerusalem. I already know it. I'm going to go through in Jerusalem. I'm going to go through hell in Jerusalem. But he said, I'm not going to take a shortcut. I'm not going to turn back. I'm not going to deny the one that sent me, that called me, that predestined me. There's a course set before me. 
He says that I'm straight away into Jerusalem. I'm going to walk right into it. You got to walk into something that's going to be painful. That's going to hurt you to your core. That will make you want to drop to your knees and people are going to talk about you. They're not going to understand why. Well, why is this happening to him or to her? They're supposed to be. They don't understand. But let them keep watching. And they'll see the glory of God. <laughs> come upon your life. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Whew. This is some tight stuff. And it says, I'm called according to his purpose and plan for those whom he foreknew before anything was, he foreknew you. As a matter of fact, everything that he created was for you. <laughs> it, it was created for, the world was created for you. After he had finished creating everything, then he put the foreknew into the world to fulfill his purpose and plan. <laughs> he did it for you. He created the garden eastward in Eden for the Adams. He did it for us. And then he brought us to bring the kingdom from heaven to earth. That's why he did it. And it says, for those whom he foreknew and loved and chose beforehand, before anything else was, he chose you. He also predestined to be conformed. He created you, but then he created you to be conformed, to change, not from a natural man, but to a spiritual man. <laughs> he gave you a mind. Not to use it as you please, but to renew it with his mind. God did it. Now, I know this is over some of y'all's head, but you better wake up and you better listen. If you're going to be able to stand what's coming on this earth, you better start listening to what I say. There's nothing that has ever happened that God did not forewarn this ministry about. Amen. Y'all better learn how to listen. He chose beforehand. He also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son and ultimately share in his completeness. Jesus Christ came, but he had to complete. That's why he said on Calvary, it is finished. I've completed the plan and purpose of God. And God says, because you submitted to my plan and my will and chose to do it my way. I have highly exalted you. Jesus couldn't just do it his way. He had to follow the direct plan and orchestration of the Father. His flesh tried to intervene. Father, if it be that we'll take this from me, take this cup from me. Three times he had to pray. Why can't you do the will of God his way? Why can't you shut up? Why can't you submit? Why can't you allow your mind to be renewed? Why can't you allow your character be shaped? Because you're not dead. You're too alive. You're still trying to bother with God. God, I'll do it, but do it this way. I pray some prayers. God, don't you hear me? He don't even answer me. 
He don't say anything. God don't answer you when you try to bother with him, when you try to change his plan, when you try to change his mind. He don't pay you no attention. He'll let you go. He didn't force, he didn't force Jesus to do it. In that garden of Gethsemane, when Jesus was crying out and praying, God didn't say, oh, yeah, you better do this. Oh, yes, you did. Yeah, you are. You better do it. God was silent. He was silent. He didn't say anything. He let him moan, and he let him groan, and he let him be in agony, and he let him plead. God. But where are you, God? I ain't changed my mind. Are you going to do it my way? Get up off your knees, and I'll send somebody else. Don't think you're indispensable, because you're not. And when God replaces, he replaces with better. But there wasn't anyone better. Because Jesus submitted. You, you, you can't. I'm going to show you some scripture. That's why I'm taking my time. I got to take you into the word to show you what I'm saying to you. Because you, you don't believe me. You, you don't believe me. A lot of stuff I say, you don't believe me. You'll go home and try to search it out and try to twist it some other way. I remember when my pastor was teaching on submission. I went home and I tried to find every other definition for submission than the one he gave. But it still came back to shut up and be quiet and learn. <laughs> there are some things we don't want to hear because we already have our mind made up. This is how it's going to be done. This is how I want it to be done. If you're in the will of God, I guarantee you he's not going to do it the way you want it to be done. <laughs> he ain't going to do it your way. I guarantee you, he will not do it. You can cry, you can, you can do it your way, but God won't be in it. He won't be in it. You'll be out there just like the rest of folks. Empty. Our pastor told me, us, Elder Tillman told me, he said, God is the only employer that will hire you, fire you, and leave you on the job. Yeah. <laughs> He's gone, and you still. But I'm an apostle, I'm a bishop, I'm a pastor, I'm a teacher, I'm an evangelist, and God gone. <laughs> Remember Elder Tillman told us that? He said, God will fire you and leave you on the job. And you out there on your own trying to make it happen. And I, I, I see it all the time. You're trying to make it happen. Because it's your idea. God said, go ahead. He will never force you to stop. He will never force you to obey. That's why he gave us a will. He gave you the right to choose. He don't force you. <laughs> Hallelujah. He also predestined to be conformed to the image of a son and ultimately share in his complete sanctification. Sanctification. We don't want to be sanctified. You used to think, oh, they go to that sanctified church. That was that church that, you know, Dan, and, and they throw sheets on. That's what they call a sanctified church. Any church of the spirit of the living God is a sanctified church. Any person that has really given themselves and say, uh, repent of their sins and receive Jesus Christ, you are sanctified. You are a saint. That's where they get the word saint from. Not haint, saint. <laughs> to be ultimately sharing his complete sanctification so that he would be firstborn, the most beloved, and honored, amen, among many brethren, and those whom he predestined, he also called. He knew you. He predestined you. So he called you for this day, brother and sister Woods, and this time to be set apart openly, but you were called. He also justified. He has given you when he called you 
and you repented of your sins and received Jesus Christ, you became justified. You are just with the Father. You're just right. You're in the right place. And he has given you already everything that you need to fulfill God's plan and his purpose. Now, you got to walk it out. But it's already there. Now it's your decision to walk it out according to his plan, according to his purpose. Your decision. He ain't going to force you. You can use the title, but you'll be fired, left on the job. Hallelujah. He also justified, declared free of the sin, guilt of sin. And those whom he justified, he also glorified, raising them to a heavenly dignity. Raising them to a heavenly dignity. What then shall we say to all these things? If God is for us, who can successfully be against us? Amen. People are going to come against you, talk about you. But if God be for you, don't you ever worry about what people say. Don't you ever worry about what people think about you. Don't, you're supposed to be gossip. You're going to find out that people that used to like you are not really going to like you anymore because there's no anointing that's going to come upon your life today. You're going to walk in a higher calling. You're going to begin to walk in your heavenly calling as ministers. And when you really walk in it, people are not going to like you. Amen. All right. So what does it mean when we are chosen. You'll find that in G, that's um, Greek, 1588. It means that you've been selected. You know, you go in a store and you look at the apples and you say, oh, I like this and this is a little bit back bigger and it looks a little sweeter and you squeeze the lemons. Oh, this one isn't so thick, it has a thinner skin so it has more juice in it. You've been selected by God. God just like, plucked you up. I select you. Hallelujah. Glory to God. It means that you are the elect of the God. The best. He selected you to be the best. Glory to God. Favorite. God says, I favor you. Wow. What did, what, what did Gabriel tell Mary? You are highly favored. You've been hand selected. You've been chosen by God. You've been plucked out of many for God. And he did it. What am I choice? It was his. God sees something in you you don't even see in yourself. I, I never saw myself doing this. I never saw it. Very shy and timid, very quiet, very introverted. Didn't like to stand before people. But not anymore. <laughs> because God, I allow God to work in me and to perfect those things in me. Amen. So remember who you are. God has justified you to do this. But it's your choice if you want to do it his way. Okay? Glory to God. You're chosen. Your favor. He's made it easy. Because he's already giving you everything that you're going to need to walk this out. But you're going to 
have to allow it to pro be perfected in you, change you, layer by layer. Skin you, <laughs> fillet you. That's what he wants to do. He's after your character, children. He's after your character. It is your character or the lack of character that will defeat you. It's not, it's not the call. The calling will never defeat you. It's your character that will defeat you. I'm going to show you some stuff. I, I'm taking my time. Now, if you sleep, you stand up. Because I'm going to deliver my soul. Because I never know this might be my last message. No, I don't think so. But I'm saying it could be. And when I stand before the Father, he said, why didn't you finish the message, Frankie? There was something I already give you to tell the people that they didn't hear. I'm holding you responsible. Anytime you're in the place where you have the opportunity to teach people, to reach people, to change people's life, you deliver your soul. Because we have some visitors here today I might not ever see it again. But I got to make an impartation. I may not, they may not ever come again, but they'll remember something I said. One plant, one water, God gives the increase. Take it seriously. I may not ever see you again, but when you stand before God, So you remember that day I sent you the Hope Evangelical Ministry and, and, and that, that, that pretty black lady stood up there <laughs> and, and was teaching. He said, you heard the truth. You heard the gospel. You refused. But you heard it. Whether you agree with it, whether you do it or not, you are going to be held responsible. Yes. Not me. Your blood will not be on my hand. Hallelujah. Glory. Now, I don't expect nobody to, you know, really watch this on social media because I'm a long-winded preacher anyway. But, you know, those that will will hear it. Those that won't, won't. Amen. I won't say those that need to hear it, no, because all of you need to hear it. Hallelujah. But it's your choice. Okay. So then... We are chosen, predestined, we were foreknown by God. Predestined means this, listen to this. When you are predestined, it means a limit. To put a limit, that's G3724, to in advance. God knows what he wants you to do. He knows to the, the, the level and the degree of the ability of teaching that he's given you. And he expects you to go to that limit. And even you can go beyond, depending upon your hungry, hunger. That's what I mean. A limit. And to advance above the limit. In other words, there's no end to your understanding. If you continue to seek him. See how you have to break these words. See I hear preachers that they're on YouTube and they are hollering and, and, act, and, and, and they read and write from the scriptures. But it's not rightly divided. And they're causing people to error because it's not the truth of God's word. It's their understanding. You can't limit God to your own understanding. That's why we give definitions and we take the time and we give you the Hebrew meaning and the Greek meaning. Just because you see chosen in one scripture don't mean that means the same thing in another. You got to study and it takes time, okay? So when, when God has predestined you that to a limit to advance in, he has ordained you, which means he has invested in you. God has invested you in you, okay? He, there's an anointing upon you that everybody don't have. He's invested a special anointing upon you. 
Mm, mm, mm. Select it. Limit. He says he expects you to go to the limit and it blow. Limit means the final. Until the day you die, you're supposed to be going higher and higher and higher and higher and higher. There's no limit. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That means that God wants to fill you up to the uttermost. Spirit, soul, and body. Fill me up to the uttermost. To the fullest boundary or point. It means that you must continue. Hebrews 7 and 25. Glory to God. Come on, young man. So you can stand up here with me. You make me look good. You handsome. You can handle it. You can handle it. Hebrews 7 and 25 in the Amplified. Glory to God. He is save us. God is able to save us to the utmost, to the greatest degree, to the greatest degree. Fill you up all the way to the longest strand of hair in your head, to your longest toenail on your foot. Fill you up like that. Uttermost. Going deep down, Hallelujah. digging and pulling up things you didn't even know within you. God said, I'm after the uttermost of you. Hallelujah. 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 Glory to God. Hebrews 7. And uh, what was that, son? 7 and 25. 25. There we go. Therefore, he is able also to save forever. No backsliding. Once you really get saved, really get saved. Now, now see, some people, they backslide three and four, five, six, seven times. They, 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 they ain't really repented from the heart. They was just kind of like tired of stuff that they were doing, and, you know, their body was wearing out. And, but when God saves you from the heart, it's forever. From the heart. Romans, the 10th chapter, say. From the heart. People just utter words. People come to the altar. You take them through the sinner's prayer. And they chewing gum and popping their fingers and, you know, that kind of foolishness. That folks ain't saved. But when you repent from the heart, when you become broken. I didn't say you wouldn't make mistakes. But you're not going to go all the way back into the world like that. When God justifies you, chooses you, predestines you, and you give your heart, you don't have to. You can be chosen and called, and I give your heart. It's your choice. God, is, he's not going to, break. he said, I stand at the door and knock. I'm knocking on your heart. I'm on the outside. Mm -hmm. Elder Tilbury used to tell us, in that spiritual door, there's only a, a handle from the inside. No handle on the outside. You got to open up your heart and let Jesus come in. Amen. That you have to do. You can say anything you want to say. If, it, if you have not opened your heart for the seed, the word of God tells us that when the seed enters into you, it remains. And if it remains, you cannot and will not habitually sin. You're not going to be a habitual sinner. I didn't say you wouldn't make mistakes. You, you, you were, you know, used to drinking. You, 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 you mess up and you take a, a sip of cavassier. Acknowledge it. Don't run away and hide. Acknowledge, Lord, I, I, Cleanse me. Yes. Cleanse me. I messed up. It's okay. Mm -hmm. If you confess your sins, I'm faithful and just not only to forgive, but to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And God, will, he'll, he'll save you. He'll clean you up. He will clean you up. When I got saved, I was scared to backside. But when the Lord saved me, he, it was a supernatural drawing for a year. And I was scared to backside. I, I didn't. 
the Holy Ghost warned. He says, if you backslide, the devil is waiting for you. You are one that will not get back. He will kill you. I wasn't ready to die. And so I stayed the course. Everybody don't get that one, but I got it. Well, you may get it, but you don't believe it. And that's why when you don't, you get the one and you don't believe it, you get back out there and sin, you catch all kind of hell. Them demons leave you when you receive Jesus Christ. If you were a drunk, if you were a whoremonger, if you were a liar, if you were an extortioner, if you were a murderer, and you get saved, and, and seven demons leave you, you go back out there in the world, you're worse. Now it's seven times seven demons. How much is that? 49. 49. You had seven demons, but you went back in and acted a fool and licked up your vomit like a dog, the word of God said. Now you got 49 demons to deal with. Whew. I got to take a sip off of that. Oh, my God. Is this teaching this morning? Yes. This is my calling. Yes. To teach and to bring people out of Egypt, which is a type of world. You don't want the 49 demons. You don't want the seven. Get rid of them. And live for Jesus. Yeah, but I... I miss that liquor. I miss that weed. When you go to hell, you still gonna want some weed, but there ain't gonna be no weed. When you go to hell, you still gonna have that desire for all of your sins that you're doing now, but you're not gonna be able to get that weed. You ain't gonna have that man. You ain't gonna have that woman. <laughs> you're gonna be constantly falling. It's the pot, bottomless pit. Broom, 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 broom. You ever dreamed about you falling? Worms eating on you, eating you up. Boy, I sure do wish I had a joint. <laughs> Ain't no joint in hell. Ain't no whole mongering. Ain't, ain't, ain't gonna be no whole mongering in hell. It ain't gonna be no sex in hell. But I just, I, I'm saying I just got to have me a man. You're going to be wanting a man in hell and he ain't going to be there. You're going to be burning up in that fire. An ever burning fire, fire that will never go out. You keep on feeding your flesh. Yeah, I got my buddy woke. Now he was nodding off on me for a minute. He wide awake now. Yeah, I know you listen. You better listen. God sent you here today because you need to be delivered. You, you got some vices uh -huh, that's tearing you up, that, that's got a hole in your pockets that's taking your money. You feeding the devil's kingdom. God loves you. That's why you're here. So you can make a decision. Somebody say hallelujah. 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 Okay. Hallelujah. The word of God has to come with a convicting power. Yes. Hallelujah. The word of God. Hallelujah. He said the Holy Ghost came to reprove the world of sin. Yeah. He came with a convicting. He's supposed to convict you of your sin, but not leaving your sin, but draw you to Christ. Hallelujah. 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 I ain't through. Amen. 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 Save us to the uttermost because we are predestined. He foreknew us to be conformed to advance to the final utmost, the furthest boundary, a point to continue. We are called, we've been invited, appointed. Glory to God. You have a free will. You can receive the call. 
You can be, pre be predestined, but you can say, no, thank you. Just like in Matthew 22, they had all kind of excuses. The king is inviting you. No, thank you. I'm not ready yet. I'm too young. I have an education. I, I don't need this Jesus. I have everything I need right here in, in this earth, ma'am. My heaven is right here on earth. I don't believe in a heaven and a hell. I don't believe in eternal salvation. I don't believe in eternal damnation. I don't believe. All kind of excuses. All kind. God says, whosoever will, let them come. Hallelujah. You must, now this is where we're going, you must qualify yourself. What? I thought God qualified me, if you allow it, which means that change. You've got to make the decision and allow the word of God to renew you, to change you, to shape you, to form you. The word of God is the hand of God that he's given to us through his fivefold ministry of callings to shape and to form you. The word is the hand of God. That's why we always hold up the fivefold ministry gift callings. It's the hand of God. When it's an anointed hand. Apostle, why do you talk to us that way sometimes? because God is using my hand. His hand is in my hand. I remember when my daughter, then I was pregnant with my beautiful daughter, granddaughter Coco, and the doctors had told her, oh, that baby's gonna be mongoloid. That baby's gonna be underweight. That baby's going to be deformed. I was working in a plant. I wasn't no pastor then. The, the, uh, the calling was still there, but I wasn't walking. I was saved, but I wasn't walking in that calling. I was under teachers and tutors, teachers, tutors, and governors. I was being taught by the fivefold ministry. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. See, we under, we under tutors and teachers and governors. God is using the shapers and to, and to prepare us for our calling. The calling is there, but it has to be cultivated. You see what I'm saying? So, God wants us to allow the word to glorify us. Listen to this. All right. Let's go to where I want to go, Father. Let's go to St. John 6 and 65. Hallelujah. Somebody shout hallelujah. Hallelujah. That resounding sound. Say it again. Hallelujah. Ooh, that sounds good to my soul. Say it again. Hallelujah. All right, that's that oneness. That's that one accord. Amen. All right. St. John 6 and 65. I tell you, I watch Jesus. And, and, and I look at what he said. I studied Jesus. I, I love Isaiah and you know, John, I love all of them. But I studied the life of Jesus because he was the perfect one. I know I'm not perfect. I never be perfect. But I can become more and more mature. I'm only going to be perfect when I'm changed out of this fleshly body into my terrestrial body, which is my glorified body. Then I'll be perfect. But as long as I'm in this celestial body, I'll never be perfect. That's why Jesus said, don't call me good. That's not good. But the Father, Jesus was in the flesh. He could have made a decision at any time he wanted to to sin, but he chose not to. Hallelujah. That's what we have to do. We're in the flesh, but we have to choose at any time to say, I don't want to sin. Amen. I don't want to fornicate. I don't want to commit adultery. I can, but I don't want to. Amen. Why? It's going to move me. It's going to steal me, my anointing from me. I'll be crucifying Jesus Christ. 
all over again. Mm. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This is what Jesus said. And he was saying, this is the reason why I have told you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted him, that is, unless he is enabled to do so by the Father. That's it. All these people saying they say they ain't say because the Father haven't drawn them. How does the Father draw them? By his spirit. Well, I just decided, well, no. Mm -mm. The Father has to, he has to draw you. The Father has to place you in the body. Like your house is your furniture, you place it where you want it to be, right? Yeah. It's Jesus Christ's body. So God places you where he wants you to be in the body of Jesus Christ. To function where he wants you to function. So nobody can come to the Father, I mean to Jesus, except the Father. Drawn by his spirit. That's why I say, as a people are not saved. People go to church, but they're not saved. <laughs> okay. No one can come to me unless it has been granted him. That is, unless he is enabled to do so by the Father. Now, hold that thought. Because remember I said you got to be glorified. you got to glorify yourself, right? Right? Yeah. Yeah. Haven't I been telling you through this message that many are called, some are even chosen, but not all are glorified because they don't continue. I'm going to show you something. I'm going to show you something. All right, brother, let's go down to verse... Um, 70, I think I want. Hallelujah. You have a good phone. It's obedient. <laughs> now, this is what Jesus is saying. Listen, always listen to what Jesus said. Open your eyes over there. Touch her. Open your eyes. You, uh, stand up if you, if you sleep. Stand up. You got to hear this. That's how our pastor used to do what? <laughs> stand up. He called you, hey, 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 stand up. <laughs> he didn't play. But we didn't doze. <laughs> we didn't want our name called. He was something else. People say, oh, you don't embarrass the saints. Sometimes that's what the saints need, is to be embarrassed to save them. Because when the devil putting you to sleep, you're missing the very point you need to hear. He, he'll rock you to sleep. Because he don't want you to hear. He don't want your mind to be renewed. Okay. Now, this is what Jesus said. Listen to him. He said this. First, uh, St. John 6 and 7. Jesus answered them, Did I not choose you, the 12 disciples? And one of you is a devil. <laughs> An ally Satan. But was he predestined? Yes. Was he called? Yes. Was he chosen by God? Yes. Did God not tell Jesus to choose Judas? Yes. But he had a what? Choice. He had a devil. Why did Judas have a devil? Because he allowed Satan to enter into him. Jesus said, but, I, uh, but he was called. He was predestined. He was chosen. He walked with me. He heard all the teachings that the other 11 heard. Yet, he chose to allow Satan to enter into him. The very words that he heard did not renew his mind. Now, the father was speaking this to me. He says, daughter, he says, but some will say that uh, uh, Judas did the will of the Father. He did, but he didn't have to. It could have been somebody else. Because Judas 
actually his intent was, well, Jesus is here, the Messiah, so he's going to save us and he's going to deliver us from the, the harsh, stern rule of the Romans. He's going to come in and kill out all the Romans and we're going to take Jerusalem back. We're going to take the temple back. That was Judah's thought. And because that was Judah's thought, he did not allow his mind to be renewed to what Jesus said. Jesus said, this temple is going to be broken down, but in three days it's going to be risen again. He was right there when he heard the revelation from Peter. Who was that? You are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus said, so it is so. Flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you. Only the spirit of God. And the gates of hell should not prevail. Judas heard all of that teaching. But he didn't allow it to renew his mind. He still had his own idea as to how it was going to be done. So I got to help God out. I got to help God. God don't know what he's doing. I'm going to betray Jesus. And then what I want to happen, what I desire to happen, it's going to be done. I'm going to get in there and I'm going to intervene with the plan of God. That's what happens when you try to change the plan and purpose of God. You intervene with your own ideas and your own thoughts. And you end up hanging yourself. It was the will of God that, that he, Jesus be betrayed, but it didn't have to be Judas. Right. Judas was sitting right there at the table mm-hmm. at the Last Supper. Right. And Satan entered into him right then. But Jesus knew all the time that he had a devil. Mm-hmm. But he gave them a chance for his mind to be renewed. Amen. To do it his way. I'm getting tired now. The, a, the anointing weighs on you heavy. Okay, this, this, is, this is good teaching. Okay, you must qualify yourself. Acts 26 and 19. I'm giving you these scriptures and I'm going to be close. Acts 26 verse 19. And the Amplified reads as follows. So King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but I openly proclaimed first to those at Damascus, then at Jerusalem, and throughout the region of Judea, and even to the Gentiles, that they should repent, change their inner self, the old way of thinking, and turn to God, doing deeds and living lives which are consistent with repentance. Paul said, I was obedient to the call. You don't have to be obedient to the call. But Paul says, I was obedient. I'm going to scope along because uh, let, let's go to 2 Timothy. This is where I want to, this is where I really want to go. 2 Timothy uh, chapter 2. And starting with verse 19, 2 Timothy ch- chapter 2, verse 19, starting with 19. Listen to this. Nevertheless, the firm foundation of God, which he has laid, you must have the foundation of God laid in you, which is his word, stands sure and unshaken despite a text bearing this seal the lord knows those who are his and let everyone who names the name of the lord stand apart from weakness and withdraw from wrongdoing now this is the apostle paul talking about how you have to work with god you have to glorify yourself or you have to prepare yourself sanctify yourself to be used by God. Listen to this. And this is the Apostle Paul teaching Timothy. And he said that, now in a large house, there are not only vessels and objects of gold and silver, 
but also vessels and objects of wood and of earthware. And some are for noble, for honorable, noble good, use, and some for dishonorable, ignoble, common. Therefore, if anyone cleanses, process of sanctification. This is what you must do. God isn't going to do it. You got to cleanse yourself. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from these things, which are dishonorable, disobedient, sinful, he will be a vessel for honor. You must cleanse yourself by the word of God, okay? Sanctified, set apart for a special purpose. Remember, I told you you were favored. You were pan picked, set apart for a special purpose and useful to the master, prepared for every good work. Then you will be prepared to do the work of the ministry. Let's go to Ephesians 4 and 1. Glory. And verse 2. So I, the prisoner for the Lord, appeal to you to live a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called. That is to live a life that exhibits godly character, personal integrity, and mature behavior. A life that expresses gratitude to God for your salvation. With all humility, forsaking self Righteousness, change your garments. And gentleness, maintaining self-control with patience, bearing with one another in unselfish love. Amen. Let's go to Romans, the ninth uh, chapter. I'm not going to read all of it, but you read it. There. Romans, the ninth chapter, start with verse 10 through 20. Do not have to go there. I want you to go here. Look at it. I'm going to give you some scriptures to write these down. First uh, Thessalonians 4, verses 3 through 8. And then we're going to talk about how that we labor with God. First Corinthians 3. We labor with God. God is not going to do all of it. God don't care nothing about you being called. He don't care nothing about you being chosen. Now there's a work that you have to do. You're going to have to allow the word to begin to do this work in you. This is your part. He's given you everything that you need to do it. But you are going to have to do it yourself. You, this is a work that you must do. Don't say, but God knows my heart. Yeah, he knows your heart. He knows that you don't want to change. He knows that he likes your old way. He knows. And he's going to fire you and leave you on the job. It's just that simple. Amen. There's a scripture where God says that he, uh, he will allow the priest's nakedness to be seen by the people. He will reveal your nakedness. And a lot of people are being exposed during this time in the pulpit. Their nakedness is being revealed because God gave them time to repent, to change their character and to change their ways. Amen. All right, um, 1 Corinthians, start with uh, 3, verse 9. Amen. For we are God's fellow workers, his servants working together. You are God's cultivated field, his garden, his vineyard, God's building. According to the remarkable grace of God, which was given to me to prepare me for my test. The grace of God is upon you. To prepare you for your test. You, you don't have to allow the grace of God to operate in your life. But you have been given the grace to fulfill your calling in ministry. He's given you everything you need. It just has to be cultivated. But it's your choice, okay? So according to the remarkable grace of God which was given to me to prepare me for my test. Like a skillful master builder, I laid a foundation, and, and now another is building on it. But each one must be careful how he builds on it. For no one can lay foundation 
other than the one which is already late, that is Jesus Christ, which is Jesus Christ. But if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will be clearly shown. When you stand before God, you're going to be identified. For the day of judgment will disclose it because it's revealed with fire and the fire will test the quality and character and worth of each person's work. If any person's work which he has built on his foundation, that is, any outcome of his effort remains and survives this test, he will receive a reward. But if any person's work is burned up by the test, he will suffer the loss of his reward. Yet he himself will be saved, but only as one who has barely escaped through fire. You can do all the work, all the good things you want to do. God said, you might be saved, but you don't have no reward. Everything that you've done and tried to do is burned up. It's not accepted by God. It's called a work of the flesh. Amen? All right. Um, now, let's go to St. John, the 17th chapter. And I'm closing on these chapters, I promise. But I want to show you about Jesus. Remember, he's our example. I keep telling you, Jesus is our example. The apostle Paul told Timothy, follow me as I follow Christ. Don't you be following people that's not following Christ. Amen. Don't you be following people that you know not right. right. Don't, don't do that. I, I don't care how much you like them. I don't care if it's your husband. If you know that man ain't right and he's trying to get you to do something wrong, you better say, honey, I love you, but you're not God. Don't let the blind lead the blind. Yeah. Hallelujah. 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 Amen. Ananias and both. Ananias and Sapphire both lied. And both of them died right there in the temple. And both of them was carried out. Following each other in their lies, in their deceit. Ain't nothing that good that you want to go to hell. You better learn how to say no. And you better learn how to say no. That's not right. And I will not fellowship with that. I don't care if it's your mother. I don't care if it's your brother, your sister, your husband, your children. If they wrong, they're wrong. And if you're upholding them and they're wrong, you're going to hell with them. You're not helping them. You're hindering. You're a hindrance. Because you ain't saved yourself. I don't care it is. I, I tell, but I always got with my children, my grandchildren. Great. I tell them, I tell, no, no, oh no, you're wrong. I'm not going to uphold you and you're wrong. You're not right because you're my daughter. If you ain't sin, I don't care if you are my daughter, my son, you're wrong. I'm not going to uphold you. It ain't no blue collar sin or white collar sin in the kingdom. Sin is sin. God see you, and I do too. You better stop. You wrong. You are hindrance. The word of God talks about hindering your brother and your sister, being an offense to your brother and sister. The word of God says that's a sin on you. If you hinder your wife, if you're telling her to do something that you know is wrong, she don't have to obey you. But you know, obey your husband in the Lord. In the Lord. He's wrong. And, and, and uh, whatever. Yeah. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. That comes, you, you got to make a decision. See, that's why the anointing don't flow. <laughs> Your character ain't right. God is after your character. My youngest son, whom I love dearly, didn't speak to me for six months because I got in him. I didn't raise my voice. I just told him flat out, da 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 da. He came around. You don't uphold people and they sin. Amen. You don't make excuses for people. 
you don't. That's why there's no anointing in the church anymore. And it's not so much that the anointing all the time is not on the under shepherd. The people are so plugged up they can't even receive it. They don't believe. Jesus was God manifested in the flesh. And he says there was not many small things I, had, I could only do in Nazareth. Like, you know, cure a few headaches or, you know, speak to a few hangnails. Because the people didn't believe who I was. They didn't receive my ministry. So they didn't receive what they needed. You can block out everything I say, and you will not receive the benefit of it. And it's anointed. Hallelujah. All right, St. John, are you there? Uh, St. John 4, and I'm closing on these, I promise. Listen, listen to what Jesus said. He said, you have sent to me. I have glorified you down here on the earth by completing the work that you gave me to do. Now, Father, glorify me. Now, Father, glorify me. Now, Father, glorify me. Now, Father, you can glorify me. Right now, Father, you can glorify me because I've been obedient. I completed the work. That's when God glorifies you. When you complete the work. When you allow him to complete you, your character, then he will glorify you. You're not going to be glorified still lying and cheating and stealing and envy and jealous and gossiping and being competitive, all that filth. You're not going to receive no glory from the Father. Being glorified me does not mean that it automatically happens. It's a process. I've completed the work, well, now glorify me. Because that glorified you by being obedient, by being an example, by manifesting myself to the people, showing the people who and how you really are. Now you can glorify me. Now, now you can put the seal of approval on me. See, see, you read scripture, and you may study it, but you're not allowing the Holy Ghost to open it up to you. <laughs> you take the Holy Ghost to open it up. Whom I predestined, I call, I justify, and I glorify. He glorified, that's the last thing he's going to do, is glorify you. Now, Father, glorify me together with yourself. <laughs> I've proven myself to be one with you, with the glory and majesty that I had with you before the world existed. I have manifested your name and revealed your very self, your real self to the people whom you have given me out of the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept and obeyed your word. Now, at last, they know with confidence assurance that all you have given me is from you. It is really and truly yours. For the words which you gave me, I have given them. I told you, you can't just get up and just preach something because you done studied it. And because you think you, you got to speak what God is telling you to say to the people. God knows who's in the congregation. He knows the heart of the people that's in the congregation. He knows what they need at any time. That's not God's sermon, that's your sermon. Sick of mess. 
Jesus says, I spoke your words. They weren't my words. They were yours. For the words which you gave me, I, I have given them. And they received and accepted them and truly understood with confidence and assurance that I came from you, from your presence. And they believed without any doubt that you sent me. I pray for them. I do not pray for the world. I'm not praying for every human being. I'm not praying for every human being. I'm not praying for everybody that's sitting up in the church. I'm not praying for everybody that said, uh, Father, forgive me of my sins because they didn't say it from there. I'm not praying for them folks. they still sinners. They are hypocrites. They are play actors up in the church. They put it on a show. They are after something in their own flesh. God said, I ain't praying for them. So if I ain't praying for them, you ain't going to glorify them. God only glorified the people that Jesus prays for. Oh, y'all don't like it up in this Amen. holiness church. Amen. But this is real teaching. I'm not preaching to be your buddy, but I am your friend. You can like it or not like it. You can stay or you can leave. It's your decision. My hands are clean. Amen. I'm going to deliver my soul. I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those you have given me because they belong to you. Let's go down to verse 17, same chapter. Now listen to this. 17 through 19. I wasn't going to minister today. I was just going to do the consecration. Father said, no, no, no. No, 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 no. You are responsible for this flock. You're standing in my stead. And you say what I say. That was the end of it for me. I said, yes, sir. So I got my Bible, my pad, and my pencil. And I went and I sat in my holy place. Now I allowed the Holy Ghost to speak. And as he spoke, I took notes. Then after he given me notes, I went and I went into the scripture. That's the way it's done with me. Amen. But I have to hear first. Right. What's the word you want your people to hear? Mm -hmm. St. John 17, sign at verse 17. Sanctify them in the truth. Because Jesus is praying. He said, sanctify. He said, the only way that these people are going to make it, you got to sanctify them. Mm -hmm. They got to be washed. They got to be made clean by your word. The only way we're going to be sanctified, the word of God tells us in the fifth chapter of Ephesians, we must be sanctified, washed by the washing of the word. Amen. Sanctify them in the truth. Set them apart for your purposes. Make them holy. Your word is truth. Just as you commissioned and sent me into the world, I have also commissioned and sent them believers into the world. For their sake, I sanctify myself. Jesus Christ said I had to sanctify myself. I was in the body. I did not come as God. I came as man in the flesh. So Jesus had to sanctify himself to keep his, his flesh under subjection to obey and fulfill the plan and purpose of God. Amen. You're not going to do it until you sanctify it. Your flesh is too alive. Mm -hmm. For their sake, I sanctify myself. He's our perfect example to do your will so that they also may be sanctified, set apart, dedicated, made holy in your truth. I do not, listen to this, I do not pray for these alone. Talking about the, 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 the uh, 11, the 12, the 11 now. He says, I do not pray for those alone. It is not for their sake only that I make this request, but also for all those who will ever believe and trust in me through this message, that they all may be one, just as you, Father, and are in one, and in, in, I in you, 
and they also may be one in us so that the world may know, believe without any doubt that you sent me. Somebody say amen. 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 And amen. 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 Now we may give you our praise for his word. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.